go. Hello, my name is David Gardner and I'm the Executive Director of the North Carolina Center for Health and Wellness at the University of North Carolina, Asheville. I want to welcome you to the live stream of the keynote addresses from the National Physical Education Institute for Monday, July 28th. I hope you enjoy and will participate in all of the live stream keynote addresses. Ladies and gentlemen, I would just like to say that was very impressive. My, my name is Artie Camilla. Uh, I'm the president of a company called Great Activities Publishing Company, and we're so glad that you're here. We are very, very glad that you're here. How many of you are here for the first time, please? Look at that. That's wonderful. Wonderful. We want you to experience what we believe to be the best physical education event in the country. And if we keep it going, it may be the best physical education event in the world. And we really, really are very serious about that. If you're in need of anything, please see one of our staff members because we're here to help you get the very best out of the keynoters, the presenters, and the entire venue. So thank you very much for coming. I'd like to introduce Dr. David Gardner. He's the executive director of the North Carolina Center for Health and Wellness here at UNC Asheville. Dave. Thanks, Artie. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, first of all, I want to extend a very uh, sincere and warm welcome, North Carolina welcome for all of you who are from outside of North Carolina. If you're from outside of the state of North Carolina, raise your hand. Right, and if you are, or if you are a North Carolina physical educator, raise your hand. All right, we are extremely excited to have uh, this event held here at UNC Asheville, and I want to welcome you to our campus on behalf of the university. Uh, UNC Asheville is the liberal arts branch of the UNC system, and so we are a public liberal arts institution. We do offer a major degree in health and wellness promotion and the opportunity for our graduates to um, earn licensure or sit for praxis uh, completion for their licensure in physical education. Uh, and we're very excited about that. But we are extremely excited about this institute, are glad that you are here, and hope that you enjoyed the next three days of this really intense, fun, and meaningful professional development experience. Throughout the conference, and you may have already interacted with some of our fellows and our mass communication students and faculty out here at the Twitter help desk, we want you to tweet, we want you to post on Facebook, we want you to use social media to share your experience here with physical education teachers and administrators all over the country and all over the world. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce really a legend in physical education from the state of North Carolina, in spite of the fact that he went to uh, a rival university of mine, Western something. Uh, this guy has done more for physical education in this state than, than most people will ever be able to do. And I've been uh, blessed to know him for many, many years. And he's gonna introduce our first keynote uh, speaker this morning, so I want you to welcome Larry McDonald. It's my honor to introduce our first keynoter. Uh, bear with me while I read. Dr. Kim Ballard is the spark quirk. Wait a minute, that's not the right person. Oh. Gene Blaze, <laughs> you knew that, right? At any rate, Gene Blaze is a physical educator through and through. Her heart and soul are with physical educators and physical education. 
So please, let's give a big warm welcome to Gene Blades. My name is Jean Blades, now Moyes. There's a story behind that, so I'll share that with you later. And I am proud to be a physical education teacher. Yes. Yeah, this is, this is the time to be in physical education because we have research. You know how everybody says, well, I know that's true, but do you have any research on that? Yes, we do. And I know someone just told me a minute ago, you're preaching to the choir. And you know what? I am preaching to the choir because you have the best voices, but we gotta have a song to sing. And we gotta know the melody. And we gotta sing in harmony. And then we gotta sing loud enough that people will listen to us. And then we gotta sing a song that everybody wants to sing along with, right? So I do have research, and I'm so excited to, to share this information with you today because we have people outside of our profession supporting what we do, that we need quality physical education in our schools because physical education is not only important in the learning process, as I will show you, it is central to the learning process. What we do in physical education lays the framework for all other learning. So buckle your seatbelt, let's get started. When we talk about physical education, we need to know what we're talking about. So define physical education. If you had 18 seconds to convince someone that physical education is important, and they said, well, you know, you say, I'm a physical education teacher. Well, what is physical education? Then what would you say? So I'm going to give you about, oh, 30 seconds, maybe a minute to talk to the people around you. Come up with a definition for physical education. What is it? Ready, set, go. Take about 10 more seconds. And thank you. Give a huge high five to each person you talk to. Say, you have a great brain. So someone want to volunteer? Give me a definition for physical education. What is it? Volunteers. Uh, Larry. It's an integral part of the total process, focused on personalized growth and success, driving to enhance your instructional giving, projecting precision, harmonious living. Okay, I can't repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the words that stuck out. He said an integral part of the whole process, and I think you said... Focused on personalized growth and success. Striving to enhance. Striving to enhance through instructional giving. Through instructional giving. Productive, efficient, harmonious living. Productive, efficient, harmonious living. What do you think? <laughs> you are hired. Pardon? Ambrose Brazelton. Am Ambrose Brazelton's definition. So if we know that physical education is preparing us for the rest of our lives, it is lifelong learning, it's how to be our physical best for the rest of our lives. I say we're not teaching eight-year-olds and 18-year-olds fitness, we are teaching eight-year-olds and 18-year-olds how to be 80 years old and climb up two flights of stairs carrying two sacks of groceries. That's what we're doing. So if we define physical education, then define exercise, because the research is on exercise. So I'm going to give you a couple of short definitions. What's the difference between movement, physical activity, and exercise? 
Movement is the big umbrella that covers not being still. So go like this, say woohoo. Woo that can even be movement. We want movement to be whole body, but just not being still. So walking to the door is movement. Physical activity is movement that expends a little bit more energy. So you're getting that heart rate up just a touch. So skipping to the door would be physical activity. But exercise in the research is getting your heart rate in the target heart rate zone and sustaining that elevation for a period of time. Now even short bouts of exercise is better than nothing. But the CDC recommends that school age children should have at least 60 minutes of physical activity daily, 30 minutes of which should be in their target heart rate zone. For us as adults, it should be 30 minutes most in your target heart rate zone most days a week with the goal being about 150 minutes. And that's just to keep you healthy. That's not to get you into a Speedo or a bikini or something. That's just to get you healthy. So keeping that in mind, why do we exercise? If you ask somebody, why do you exercise? They might say, oh, I wanna feel healthier, or I wanna ward off disease, or I wanna prevent disease, or they might say, I wanna get into a Speedo or a bikini. But here's the big headline. The reason why we exercise is for our brain, also our body. And each one of these key components is supported by the neuroscience on cognitive neuroscience. Things like exercise boost brain function. In other words, you think better. It improves your ability to think. It also strengthens your memory. Listen to this. When you exercise, anything you've learned in the last 48 hours will be strengthened because exercise structurally strengthens your secondary dendritic branching, which is your memory system. So if we have daily quality physical education taught by a professional with all the equipment and all the facilities we need, there will never be any peaks and value, valleys. You're a, you're a tough audience. Don't I hear a little hallelujah amen on that? Man, I just justified your whole job. Yeah, just with that little one piece of research and it gets better. It prepares the brain for learning. Exercise primes the brain for learning structurally and also putting patterns into a sequence. I'm going to show you how it counterbalances the ill effects of poverty and also helps different brains like ADHD brains, teenage brains, obese brains. As a matter of fact, today, and I didn't get to put it on the PowerPoint because it just came out this morning, a research from the Medical Daily source saying that exercise is the single best thing you can do for your health. It is the common thread that follows all of our diseases, warding them off. The single best thing you can do for your health starts with an E. What is it? Exercise. Is what you do important in the learning process? No, it's central to the learning process. Let me have a little amen on that. It's not only important, it is central to the learning process. So the reason why we exercise, listen to this, it benefits your brain first. Before it even benefits your body, exercise benefits your brain. Why? Because we don't, our brain does not store its own fuel, nor does it produce its own fuel. It's totally relying on the body to pump that blood to the brain and the oxygenated blood feeds your brain. You're sitting there with about 20% of your blood supply right now going through your brain. So we've got to nourish that brain. How do you do that? Exercise. And the more efficient that cardiovascular system is, then the better the brain works. And I, as I will show you with some of the research, very specifically how it affects our learning brain, especially the reading brain. Also, when you exercise, you grow new brain cells. Raise your hand if you know anybody that needs some new brain cells. Oh, don't point, that's not nice, yeah. So we grow new brain cells. So let's pretend that's my key concept. Exercise grows brain cells, so say that with me. 
Exercise grows brain cells. Now let's put a little action to it. Go like this, say exercise, exercise. grows brain cells. brain cells. Do it again. Exercise grows brain cells. Now turn and show your neighbor exercise grows brain cells. Show them. Now without saying anything at all, just show me exercise grows brain cells. What does it look like? So what we're doing, if you're growing new brain cells, that means you're giving the brain more capacity to learn. Did you hear that? You're giving the brain more capacity to learn. Now when you give the brain more capacity to learn, that means you're improving things like working memory. You're improving things like memory and retrieval. And then when you exercise also, as I mentioned, you strengthen that memory, your secondary dendritic branches. This is really cool. Every time you learn something new, you grow a dendrite. So show me your dendrites. Ooh, look how smart you are. Now, if you learn something new about this subject, the dendrite branches. So show me secondary dendritic branching. They think this is your details that you know about this subject. So they think Alzheimer's might be the clumping up or the shriveling away of those secondary dendritic branches, which is why they only remember what they learned a long time ago. So far, so far, the only thing scientists have found that strengthens this structure, that strengthens that memory starts with an E. What is it? Anybody seeing a trend here? So then another thing that happens is when you exercise, your brain and body goes back into balance emotionally because exercise puts your neurotransmitters, your brain chemicals, back into balance. One of your brain chemicals, chemicals is endorphins. So go like this, say endorphins. Yeah, endorphins make you feel good about yourself. And one way to raise endorphins is exercise. Another way is this, turn to the people around you, give them a little knuckle bump with a jellyfish and tell them glad you're here. Now here's my instant replay. You went like this and went, glad you're here. You didn't go, glad you're here, you know. And when you smiled like that, especially if you giggle, now I know this research is true because it was from Dr. Oz. So you know it has to be true. When you belly laugh and noise comes out, oh, 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 you can burn up as many as 10 calories. Yeah, so we need to do that. So exercise even puts our, our moods back into balance. And then it also creates a protein, more protein, that's called BDNF. Say that with me, BDNF. If you're taking notes, don't write this down, but it, it stands for brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's just the miracle grow for your brain and it is housed in our large muscles. Show me where your large muscles are, or were. Yeah, you're also <laughs> sitting on one, so there's some large muscles, and that's where BDNF is housed. And that research is really um, exciting. I'll explain that to you. We're made to exercise. Would you agree with that? We're made to exercise. We are made in our genetic code to cover about 22 miles a day on foot. Of that 22 miles, about eight of those miles is supposed to be by exercising. Is that happening in your life? Hope so, that's what we're trying to teach, but in this generation, we're into a lot of sitness and not a lot of fitness. We sit, we sit to eat, we sit to be entertained, we sit to learn, we do a lot of sitting, but yet we're made to move. So, when you're made to move then, also we are not designed to run faster than an antelope can run, but we can outlast an antelope. You are sitting here because your ancestors were really good runners. They had to run to go get food and run to keep from being food, so that's why you're sitting here. But yet the chair is the least effective environment for learning. This is Dr. John Medina, who wrote a book called Brain Rules. It says the chair is the least effective environment for learning. So we're gonna put that into practice. Now I think you've been sitting here long enough, because some of you came kinda of early, that your brain and body is changing. You see, when a human sits for longer than about 17 minutes, plus or minus two, the physiology of the brain and the body starts to change. 
you're sitting at 90 degree angles at your hips, your knees, and your ankles, so you're not getting much blood flow. And if you've crossed your arms or crossed your legs, you're cutting off the blood flow even more. And because you're not using your big muscles, you're not fertilizing your brain. And after about 17 minutes or so, the brain sends a signal to the body that says, our human is not navigating. Therefore, our human must be sleeping. How many of you got a great night's sleep last night? Oh man, that was good. <laughs> like a fifth of you? Well, the rest of you are sleep deprived. And you see it in your classes. You know, this one, and then they start doing the recliners. But what's giving you away the most is that foot's just a wiggling, trying to stir up your BDNF. So we got to get these kids up in the classroom and move them around because after they come back from your physical education class and you've gotten their heart rates up, they're in prime learning state for about 60 to 90 minutes. But in the classroom, that ain't happening. So we're going to do a little uh, activity here. And I'm going to sing a song. Sorry. I'm a mockingbird, not a canary. And your job is to listen. And what you're listening for are words that begin with the B sound. Buh. Words that begin with a B. When you hear a word that begins with a B, if you're sitting, you will stand. And if you are standing, you will sit. Now, time out. When you stand up, the chair goes, doesn't it? So instead of sitting all the way back down, can you just kind of squat on that chair so that you're pretending like you're sitting? And if that doesn't work for you, you can do this like this. So you're listening for words that begin with a B. Get ready. Here we go. My bonnie lies over the ocean. My bonnie lies over the sea. My bonnie lies over the ocean. So bring back my bonnie to me. Bring back, bring back. Oh, bring back my bonnie to me, to me. Bring back, bring back. Oh, bring back my bonnie to me. Very good, you may have a seat. Yeah, now show me a big W like this. Another big W like this. Put that on your cheeks, say wow. Wow, that was really good. But I'm gonna challenge you a little bit. Same song, same instructions. You're listening for the beginning B sound. If you're sitting, you will stand. Standing, you will sit. But this time, you're also gonna listen for words that begin with an M, the M sound. When you hear a word that begins with an M, you will clap. So you're gonna clap on M, sit or stand on B. Here we go, ready? My bonnie lies over the ocean. My bonnie lies over the sea. My bonnie lies over the ocean. So bring back my bonnie to me. Bring back, bring back. Oh, bring back my bonnie to me, to me. Bring back, bring back. Oh, bring back my bonnie to me. Very nice, have a seat. Let me see another big W. Say, wow. Now, here's my instant replay. What just happened? Well, that little activity, my body lies over the ocean, is movement with intention. What was it? Movement with intention. Because, let's say the principal walks in and you're doing my body lies over the ocean and he or she says, well, how is this raising test scores? Well, here's what we just did. Academically, we're isolating beginning sounds, in particular the B sound and the M sound. And then, physiologically, you were activating those big muscles in your legs by standing, sitting, standing, sitting. So I just fertilized your brain with BDNF. So now your brain is fertilized, and I, or at least activated, so that um, we can, for the next portion, you're ready to learn. Also, I got you listening, but then I watched you process. The auditory people in here, that was pretty easy for you because you heard that and you were reacting. You were wondering why everybody was laughing. And auditory people speak to you auditorily. They'll say, now listen, I hear what you're saying and they, sound, they sign their emails, let me hear from you soon. Those are the auditory people. 
Now, the visual people in here, I'm sorry, that messed you up, didn't it? All those people <laughs> sitting and standing. You had to watch that. And you want visual people in your class because they're the only ones that read all those posters you put up. <laughs> Nobody else reads those, just the visual people. And they talk to you visually. They'll say, now, look, I see what you mean. And they sign their emails, see you soon. Now, I'm assuming and I notice that most of you are kinesthetic in here. Would you agree with that? And that was way too hard for us. We didn't hear those sounds at all. We didn't care, though. We liked that sit, stand, clap part. So we just sit, stand, clap, sit, stand. We didn't get it right, but neither did the rest of the people. So just sit, stand, clap, sit, stand, clap. And we talk to you kinesthetically. We'll say, can you walk me through that? Uh, run that by me again. And then we sign our emails, keep in touch, because we're the tactile people as well. So you can see how people are processing. But what the benefit of that, that benefit of that little physical activity, write this down, will last 15 to 20 minutes depending on the person. And it was a transition type movement because it was focusing on your auditory system and your temporal lobe. So if the next thing I want you to do is listen, which it is, now your brain is ready to listen. Now I'm not sure, but I think I coined the phrase brain break. I think I did, because I remember thinking of it on a walk, but maybe not. But anyway, I don't like that phrase anymore. You don't want your brain to take a break, because then you die. So I call it a brain blast, or a brain energizer, or a brain booster. Let's call it something else besides a brain break, because we don't want the brain to break. So here we go. So here's, um, here's how the brain pays attention. Now this little guy, is at a sit-down desk, it's a kinesthetic desk. Notice when he's focusing, he's not pedaling. But when he's not focusing, then he stops. I said that wrong. When he's focusing, he stops pedaling. When he is in transition, then he pedals because the brain can only pay attention to one thing at a time. This is a behavior modification course, or class. If this little guy didn't have something to do in his transition time, what would he be doing? Picking on people and getting in trouble. Here's a stand-up desk. Again, they're working on writing a letter to one of their classmates who was in a car accident. Notice he's just got one foot swinging when he's not writing, but then when he starts to focus, then his feet stop. So this is an example of getting up and moving around in the classroom. So the big headline is, this could be your bulletin board for the first six weeks, what makes us move is also what makes us think. The exact same system that we use to get out that door, which comes from our cerebellum, is exactly the same system that the brain uses to read with. Do you have any research on that? Yeah, that's Dr. Buddy's research that they showed that the cerebellum and the prefrontal cortex were connected. So make a little fist, put it right here between your eyes, say prefrontal cortex. This is where you pay attention. Anybody work with teenagers? Anybody have some teenagers at home? Anybody growing some teenagers? They'll be teenagers eventually. Watch this, who has survived a teenager? Yes, that would be us. Their prefrontal cortex up here is on vacation, so they're not really uh, paying attention. Well, they're paying attention to a lot of things, just not you, um, probably other people. Anyway, so theirs is on vacation, but put your hands back here, say cerebellum. We thought until Dr. Buddy's study that that was just motor skills, agility, coordination, a little bit of balance. Now we know that, write this down, the cerebellum initiates putting all patterns into a sequence. That's where our pattern sequencing starts in the cerebellum. The cerebellum put, initiates putting all patterns into a sequence. That's like letters into words, words into sentences, sentences into stories. So that's where it happens, in the cerebellum. So who works on the cerebellum? That was a question. <laughs> Let me ask it this way. Where in the school day do we work on motor skills, agility, coordination, a little bit of balance? 
So is what you do important in the learning process? No. What's the word? Central. This is huge. What we do in our physical education curriculum lays the framework for all other learning, and that's the neuroscience. That's not an opinion. And there's lots of research on that. As a matter of fact, there's 38,000 entries in the medical um, reference books that reference how movement, physical activity, and exercise helps cognitive function. So if somebody says, do you have any research on that? You go, yeah, we do. So this is really important because if it lays the framework for all learning, don't we need daily quality physical education taught by a professional with all the equipment and all the facilities we need? Little hallelujah, amen. Because what we do gives every child every advantage to learn. Now let me show you. Here's the research. So buckle your seatbelt. A compilation of research is in the book called Spark. How many of you know that book? How many of you have read that book? How many of you have stuck that book under the nose of your decision makers? How many of you have no idea what I'm talking about? Because if you don't, you're about five years behind. So you need to get this book because it is the compilation of how exercise helps the brain coming from a clinical psychiatrist slash neuroscientist, Dr. John Rady. So there's a good resource for you. But here's some breaking news. How many, don't, you don't have to raise your hand, but if you have Alzheimer's in your family, heads up, because this is the new research. This is BDNF. And I remember it, big dog, no fleas. Now, where is BDNF housed? Show me. Large muscles, so keep that in mind. And it's the miracle grow for the brain. Now, here's the good news. All of us were born with BDNF. It's a protein we're born with. You'll never run out. There's the good news. But you can make more. How do you make more BDNF? It starts with an E. Exercise but you can activate it. It's stored in your large muscles. You activate it by using your large muscles. So, I know this looks like an eye test, but I have to do this. This is death by PowerPoint right here, but I have to do this because it's new research. So the researchers were saying, okay, how does BDNF help the brain? So they, with all this very sophisticated research, they found that there is a chemical um, it's a protein, and it's called FNDC3. So I remember it, FNDC3. Thanks for getting that. So it's released, and um, it's released with endurance exercise. That's what they say in the science. We call it sucking air exercise or puking exercise. Like you really got your heart rate up. That's when it's released. Now, it gets into your system, and then it increases the, the higher the levels of the FNDC3. That's what activates the BDNF to do things like grow new brain cells. Now, the FNDC3 is also released into the bloodstream as irisin, I-R-I-S-I-N. So, they did some research on rats. They always do research on rats. Now, these were very happy teenage rats initially, but they had genetically designed them to get Alzheimer's. So they, you know, that's what we want, a bunch of rats that can't remember anything. That's what I'm saying. But anyway, they were going to get Alzheimer's no matter what. So they injected this artificial irisin into three groups of the rats. The first group of rats were at either going to get Alzheimer's or the very beginning stages. The second group of rats were in the mid stages of Alzheimer's, and the third group of rats were in advanced stages of Alzheimer's. So they interjected this irisin. It had no effect at all on the rats that were in the um, advanced stages. But listen to this, the irisin slowed the progression of the Alzheimer's in the mid stages. And in the rats that hadn't gotten it yet, or they were in the early stages, it halted, did you hear that word? It halted all but 20% of the rats. Now where do you get at irisin? It starts with an E. 
Do you see a trend here? Now they're gonna go create artificial irisin. Where do you get natural irisin? Physical education, a quality physical education program helps to ward off disease like Alzheimer's. Now if that ain't good news, I don't know what is because many of us have that in our, in our families. So we teach different brains and different learners. We know from the research that male brains and female brains work differently. Notice I didn't say better or worse, not better, not worse, just differently. We also know that teenage brains work differently because they're not paying attention in the same way. So we have to repeat a lot with teenage brains. We also know now that if you are overweight or obese, that brain learns differently because high fat, high sugar diets impede the ability of the brain to uptake its glucose. So therefore the brain's not getting its fuel, therefore it's learning differently. We also know that children who speak a different language at home other than English learn differently because they're having to process through three different languages. And we know that children who live in poverty their brains work differently. They learn the same way as you and I do, but they remember differently because they're in toxic stress and they lose large uh, parts of their memory overnight even. Okay, so you're teaching a 14-year-old male who is obese, who speaks Spanish, who lives in the poverty level, and you're supposed to teach them in exactly the same way you do everybody else. Doesn't work that way, does it? Have you heard this? We're leaving children behind. Have you heard that? Well, if we are, let's go get them. Let's go find out where they are and let's move them forward. Because the one common thing that we can do for all of those groups starts with an E. So we need daily quality physical education taught by a professional with all the equipment and all the facilities we need. Amen, hallelujah. Okay, so let's talk about teaching the whole child. Raise your hand if you know anybody with ADHD. Don't point, yes. <laughs> now this is Dr. Um, Michael Hopkins' work. Look at the name of his study. Exercise makes you smarter. So we, we studied a little bit about BDNF. So he was looking with kids with ADHD, school-aged children who were already identified and medicated for ADHD. And he measured their BDNF levels. And he found that their BDNF levels were lower than, than normal. By the nature of being ADHD, describe someone with ADHD. What do they want to do all the time? Move which muscles? Big muscles. Where's your BDNF housed? So they are screaming, I need to get more BDNF, but what are we doing? Sit there, be still. What's the matter with you? Do not move. <laughs> That's why we need those exercise balls in the classroom. That's why we need those stand-up desks that they can pedal. That's why we need to get those kids moving because they are screaming that they need more BDNF. But more importantly, we need to have them in daily quality physical education because we are satisfying their needs. So one of the different brains was ADHD. Did you know that um, physical education can help kids in poverty? Now when I say poverty, what did you picture in your mind? What would be your definition of poverty? Most people attach it to low socioeconomic status, but that's not necessarily true. You could have a child who was in a high income family that is in poverty. Why? Because the definition is deprivation. Being deprived to the point that it affects your mind, body, soul, and spirit. So if, let's say that they, um, one of their parents passed away, now they're deprived of that relationship. What if um, they move to a different city and now they're deprived of those relationships until they can cope, they're living in poverty. So I'm gonna show you how exercise directly counterbalances the ill effects of poverty. Um, another definition of poverty is toxic stress, chronic stress to the point that it's, you're in your allostatic load. Now, acute stress, when you're under stress, it physically, are you listening? 
it physically changes your brain. Neurons, when they're stressed, hunker down because the brain will always survive first. So when they're under that much stress, the brain hunkers down. It stresses the neurons to the point that it affects neurons in exactly the same place that you learn. Put your hand on your head like you have a headache. Say frontal lobe. This is like the library of our brain, but this is where um, we do judgments, planning, and impulsivity. And then put that little fist right between your eyes, say prefrontal cortex. This is where you pay attention. So that part of your brain is hunkered down. This is also starts, this initiates your uh, cognitive thinking or your ability to think. And then make two fists like this. This is like a brain model. By the way, that's about the size of your brain. Are you disappointed? <laughs> Look at you checking out your neighbor. In this case, size does not matter, so don't worry. <laughs> So move your thumbs out of the way and you'll see the space created by your fist looks like a heart. That's the limbic system of your brain. So say limbic. Now this is your emotional filter, but um, wiggle your ring finger and say hippocampus. Thank you. That's the learning and memory center of your brain. Notice it's housed in your emotional center because emotion drives attention, which drives learning. So it's part of... Learning is part of your emotional system as well. But the hippocampus is where we learn and remember, and also where we pull the retrieval of our memory. The hippocampus is also where you grow new brain cells, which is pretty exciting. If you're gonna grow them in your learning and memory center is a great place to grow them. But that hunkers down when the brain is under stress. And when the brain is under stress like that, then your neurons generate a weaker signal you handle less blood flow to the brain, so your brain's not getting nourished in the same way. You uh, pr process less oxygen. You know how kids that are under stress, they breathe from way up here, and you can actually see it in their neck. And then you, the connections that you've made, the neural pathways don't work the same way. Now take a picture of this slide, because this is the slide of the century. When you exercise, right after you've exercised, your neurons generate a stronger signal. Your neurons increase blood flow, or if there's increased blood flow to your brain. You process more oxygen because you've been deep breathing. You extend more connections to nearby cells, plus you get the benefit of growing new brain cells, reducing your stress and cortisol, and you improve your mood. Is what you do central to the learning process? How many of you teach in a school that is like a Title I school? Take this information back. Now, I'm not naive. I've been teaching for 130 years. And I know that when the kids in poverty leave us, they're going to go right back into that poverty situation. What this research shows us is that we can help them when they're in that poverty situation. We can buffer them to the ill effects of poverty with exercise. So that's why we need daily quality exercise. We also know that exercise improves the brain function of teens. That's pretty good news. Don't you think? They do have brain function, by the way, just so you'll know. Um, and that's because we can balance their emotional states because they're a very emotional um, creature. And so we can balance that emotional state using those um, neurotransmitters. Your brain and body goes back into balance. Now show me endorphins, say endorphins. Woohoo! Yeah, the endorphins job actually is to heal you, but it also makes you feel good about yourself. And then go like this, like you're kind of mellow. Say serotonin. That's your mood regulator. And mood, the exercise increases your endorphins. Exercise in combination with your diet, eating complex carbohydrates, and then if you can kick in a little tryptophan there, then you can balance your serotonin. And that's what Thanksgiving is, isn't it? So that's why we love Thanksgiving. Now go like this, like you're kind of nuts. Say cortisol. Now cortisol is activated in your body. It's a neurotransmitter. When you perceive you're under stress, your cortisol levels elevate. So go like this and say homeostasis. 
This is your balance point. Notice it's a little dynamic. Now when cortisol elevates, show me elevated cortisol, then you go, your body and brain go into hyper or hypo attentiveness. When the cortisol can go down like you're coping or you're getting rid of the stress, the cortisol goes to here. You have to work at getting it all the way down. And once cortisol is elevated, it takes six hours for cortisol even to go to here. Six hours is the whole school day. So if your kids have a dysfunctional bus ride to school, they're gonna be in cortisol elevation all day. The fastest, quickest way to get that cortisol down is vigorous, sucking air, puking, <laughs> exercise. So they need daily uh, physical education, not that we make them puke every day, but that we just give them that good exercise. And then go like this, like you're sparking, pew, pew, pew. say norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is your pay attention neurotransmitter. And let me illustrate it for you. Please stand up where you are. You don't need to put your stuff down. Just stand right up. Your norepinephrine just kicked in. How do I know that? Because it's triggered right here where your Achilles tendon fits up in, underneath your gastrocnemius muscle. When you stand up, you learn 10% better standing than you do sitting simply because of blood flow efficiency. Also, when you stood up, you went into focus and attention. You have to, to stay safe. It goes back to when we were cave people and we had to be aware of where that saber tooth tiger was in case it was gonna come eat us. So we go into a heightened sense of focus and attention. Uh, I hope you can do this. Jump up and down three times. One, two, three. Can you turn around? Three times, one, two, three. Jump up and down three times. One, two, three. Turn the other way. One, two, three. Clap three times. Stomp three times. Clap three times. And stomp three times. Say yay! yay. And have a seat. And see if you haven't awakened a little bit. Just by standing up, turning around, jumping up and down, I've got your body and your brain in a better learning state for at least the next 15 to 20 minutes. Because write this down, the positive benefits of that little physical activity will last 15 to 20 minutes depending on the person. Why? Because you stood up, you circulated your blood, you crossed your midline several times, you got that blood flowing, but also you went into focus and attention. And then at the end, you said, yay, that raised your endorphins and your norepinephrine's kicked in, so now you'll pay attention. Go like this, like, woohoo, say dopamine. We are dopamine creatures. But Dr. C uh, Candace Pert, who wrote a book called Molecules of Emotion, said that in every cell of our body, there is a molecule dedicated to joy and bliss. Isn't that a great thought? We were put on this earth to be joyful and blissful. But some of us are not so joyful and blissful, especially first thing in the morning, don't point. So we enter, the natural way to elevate our dopamine is social interaction along with exercise and a little bit of diet because artificial dopamine comes in the form of caffeine, nicotine, uh, alcohol, hard drugs, now you know why you like chocolate so much. So that is our dopamine. And when we exercise, we put those back into balance. Now let's talk about those second language learners. Now heads up, here is amazing research that just came out about two months ago from Charles Hillman, University of Illinois Champaign. Look at this. Children who are physically fit have faster and more robust neural electrical brain responses during reading compared to their less fit peers resulting in better language skills. Raise your hand if you're a reading teacher. Raise your hand, every single hand in here should be up. You are preparing that brain to accept language and express language when they're more physically fit. That is amazing research right there. 
So is what you do central to the learning process? Yes. So that's the second language learners. And then look at this. This is new research that just came out. We know what obesity does to our bodies, and we know how it puts our bodies out of balance. They did research on little obese four-year-olds and found that their secondary, uh, secondary dendritic branching, like this, looked withered. So they named it pre-Alzheimer's. They're four years old and they're showing signs of pre-Alzheimer's. So look at this new research. There is a link between obesity and cognitive function. Cognitive function means your ability to think. Obese children are slower than healthy weight children to recognize when they have made an error and correct it. This was the research they did. So their brain is working slower. Weight status not only affects how quickly children react to stimuli, but also impacts the level of activity in the cerebral cortex during action monitoring, which means you're reading something and you know how to correct it. And so that has, that's a necessary skill for academic success. Obesity is not just a health problem. It's not a budget problem. It's a learning problem. And there's the research. So is what you do central to the learning process? Yes, because we've got to get these kids back into balance. Now, so what is action-based learning? What is the neuroscience? When you say brain-based or brain-compatible, we now know that we have facts in the neuroscience like exercise grows brain cells, like brain is pattern seeker, like the BDNF, like the neurogenesis. What does that look like in your classroom? What you do in physical education then takes all of that science and makes it, puts it into application. So what you do in physical education is brain compatible. That's why they give you the biggest room in the whole school. And that's why they give you 900 kids at a time. Because you have the most brain compatible classroom in the school. And what you do lays the framework for all other learning. We, what we do though is movement with intention. So if you ask a principal, well, you know, why don't you have PE every day? Well, because we don't have enough money. You know, we, we got to raise those test scores. And then we got to engage those students more. Have you ever heard that? Well, here's some data that I think is going to blow your socks off. Let's see if I can get this going here. did that because they were trying to get money for their school to get um, more desk. Okay, how does this work? Now, let's see if I can do it. Don't you love it when there? Oh, shoot. Everybody look at me and say, bless your heart. Bless your heart. View the slideshow. Why isn't it? Oh, I know. You got to do that little X up there. Right? Oh, darn. Okay, now let's try it. There. So, yay! I love it when it works. I want to show you some data from action-based learning school.
Now what they did was they had nine students that they had identified as the lower students in the first grade reading class. This was the reading group that had no action-based learning. This was in one month. They all raised one level. By the way, E is supposed to be the benchmark. This was the data from a reading group that did table instruction, but they would get up and do jumping jacks or something, not, not really intentional movement. One child went up three, one, one. This was using action-based learning only in the action-based learning lab. Student uh, G went up four, student H went up two, and student I went up four and reached the benchmark. Now these were the lowest performing kids on the campus. And then, this was high frequency words that they're supposed to know by the end of the first grade. This was in three days. This was improvement in three days using action-based learning, which is getting up, moving around, acting out the learning. The first child was absent the first day, but doubled. The second child, when they were supposed to know 50 words, went from 23 to 50, and the last one went from 14 to 47 in three days. So that's pretty impressive data. Yeah, thank you. And then these, I'm not gonna do that one. So let me show you some of the, go, I'm not doing that one. Okay, and here's some of our enriched environment rooms that these are labs that the kids go to to increase their academics. And this is the one that's for the, um, the senior high, now this was a group of girls who um, you can tell they were the, the supreme bless your hearts in the school. Y'all aren't from the South, are you? <laughs> you can say anything about anybody as long as you say bless your heart right after it and that kind of erases all guilt. So this is how they shook out here. And then this is after just six weeks. So the data is there, and you all have data too, because I've seen it. When we know now we can correlate fitness gram scores with, um, we can correlate fitness gram scores with our data. So healthy, active kids make better learners. Physical education is the core, have you heard that? Not the common core, it's the core of the learning process. Can physical education improve test scores? Yes, with quality PE, and no, if there's no quality PE. We gotta have daily quality physical education taught by a profession with all the equipment and all the facilities we need. It's about giving every child every advantage to learn. So why do we teach PE? Because the brain is only as healthy as the body that carries it. And we're doing this for the kids. We're doing this because kids are number one and it's all about their health and their learning. So thank you, go forth now and let's change the world, one little heart and one little brain at a time. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you.